The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right. Um, so today we're going to keep talking about boundary value problems. Um, we'll do that again on Wednesday. Um, on Friday, we'll start partial differential equations. Um, and next week, uh, we'll work with ComSol, uh, which I hope you guys all have installed on your laptops. Um, please check that you have it installed and you can turn it on. Um, your licensing things work and stuff like that. We'll have a ComSol tutorial, I think, on Monday in class. Um, and you'll use that for one of the homework problems. Not, not immediately, but uh, coming up. Um, all right. Speaking of the homework, um, I received some feedback that, uh, that the homeworks have been taking an inordinate amount of time. Um, and so I've uh, discussed this with the other uh, people involved in teaching it, and we decided to drastically cut the amount of points given for write-ups to try to encourage you not to spend so much time in that. Um, and instead, uh, I'd really rather you spent the time and did the reading instead of spending an extra hour doing write-up. So um, we won't, you won't get any more points for doing it. So if you want, I mean, I love write, beautiful write-ups. I'm sure the graders appreciate the beautiful write-ups. It's good for your thinking to write clearly, but it's not worth many, many hours of time to do it. Um, and in general, you know, the, the instructions at the beginning of the course are, you know, when, on average over the course, you have 14 weeks, should be about nine hours per week of homework. So that's maybe 13 hours per assignment, because we have 10 assignments. And so uh, if it's getting to be 15 hours, you spend too much time on it and just forget it. Just draw a line, say I'm done. You know, time ran out, and that's fine. Uh, it's, this is um, getting the last bug out of your MATLAB code is not the main objective of this course. So. Um, all right. And you know, really the purpose of homework is to, t is to help you learn, not, not that we need to know what the solution to this problem is. It's not, you know, we, I'm getting the solution from somebody else in the class, too. So this is, I don't need it from you. Uh, right, the TAs probably already did it already, and they had the solution, too. So we know the solution. It's, it's not so essential. It's, it's the purpose is to help you learn and help you figure it out. And beyond a certain point, it's not that instructive, in my experience. Though sometimes. The 15th and a half hour, you suddenly have the great insight, and you learn a lot. But most of the time, not. All right. Um, and by the way, the reading is this is in Beer's textbook, pages two fifty eight to three eleven. And there's also some nice uh, short readings um, made by Professor Bratz that have been posted, um, only a few pages long, but definitely worth a worth a look. Um, both one. BVPs and also in ODEs and DAEs. Um, all right. So today what we're going to talk about is uh, um, relaxation methods. Um, and we, we talked last time about the shooting method, um, so that's uh, a good method. Um, uh, at least one famous numerical methods book recommends you always shoot first, then relax. So try the shooting method. If it works, you're done. If it doesn't work for you, then you may have to use a relaxation method. Um, and we'll talk now about the relaxation methods. And the general idea is you, you're going to write uh, your why which is an approximation. It's not going to be the real solution. And you're going to try to write that um, typically as an as a expansion to some basis functions. So let's say the nth component of y um, and then you're going to vary these coefficients, the d's, to try to make your solution as good as possible. And now we're going to talk about different definitions of what good is for a solution, for a 
uh, problem. Um, and you have to be aware that almost always this will not exactly solve the differential equation system. So it's, it's always going to be wrong everywhere, typically. And you can get to decide sort of, if you want it to be good at some particular spot, you can do something about that. If you want it to, on average, be good in some way, you can decide that. And uh, it's sort of like how much error you can tolerate. Um, and in general, you'll have to do a finite sum of a finite basis set. For many, many OD PVP problems, there's math proofs that if, and the limit as this goes to infinity, if you add an infinite number of functions here, you can always make it work to give the true solution. But you can never afford that, so you're always doing a finite truncated, truncated basis set is what you're using. And so a lot of the accuracy things have to do with exactly what functions you choose and exactly how many terms in the sum you include. Um, but typically in these problems, you'll start from the beginning, you'll say, I'm only going to include so many, um, how big my computer is. And, and so you're going to be stuck with some error. So that's just the way it is. Um, so let's recall the problem we have. If we write it in the, as a first order ODE system, it's dy dt. Well, there's some function of dy dt and y and t that's equal to 0, which often can be written something like this, d y dt is equal to an f of t y. Right. And so if you plug in this approximation for y, then you'll get something here that'll be some g of t that's not, generally not going to be equal to 0. And you, but you would like it to be 0. If you put the true solution in, you would get 0. You put your, your approximate solution in, it's not going to be 0. Okay? So you get g of t, and you want this equal to 0 for all t. And then in addition, you have boundary conditions. Um, and so you have <coughs> boundary conditions on the solution, and you want those things to be satisfied. And again, you can write them in a form that they have, something has to be equal to 0. Often, you'll exactly satisfy them. So you'll choose your solution to make sure it satisfies the boundary conditions, and it won't satisfy in the domain. It won't really satisfy the differential equation. That's the most common thing you do. Um, but it could also be that it doesn't satisfy the boundary conditions either. Um, but you want it to be close to satisfy the boundary conditions. OK, so we have to think of um, how we're going to judge if the solution is accurate or not, if our approximate solution is good. And from the way we wrote it, we have our parameters, d. These are numbers we can adjust. And we're going to try to adjust them to make the solution as good as possible. And now we just define what a good means. There's several definitions of good that are widely used. And um, uh, one of them is called collocation. This is like option number one. And that is you choose a set of, of t's of particular time points. And for those particular time points, you demand that g of the time point is equal to 0. So you're forcing the. Um, you're forcing the residuals. This is called the residual. It's the, the error. And you're forcing the error to be 0 at some particular time points. And generally, between the time points, it will not be equal to 0. Okay? Um, but, you can, but you can pick your time points. And depending on which ones you pick, you'll get a slightly different optimal choice of the Ds. Right? Because the Ds will be adjusted to force the residual to be 0 at your, at your time points you pick. Okay, so that's, that's one option. Another one is called Rayleigh Ritz. And that one is you minimize over all your Ds the integral from T0 to T final of the norm of G of T.
So this means you're trying to make the average of the square of the deviation to be as small as possible. So it's like sort of like a least squares fit kind of thing. Okay, so that's another option. And then a third one that people use a lot is called Galerkin's method. And his method is you choose some functions, some of your basis functions typically, and you integrate them with each of the elements of the residual. And you demand that that has to be equal to zero. Yeah? The d's, all the, the, your coefficients. And these ones I didn't write it out, but this g depends implicitly on the d's. So I can write that way. A lot of d's. And so you, you optimize the d's. You vary the d's to force g to be zero at certain t's. And this one also, the g depends on d's. And so you're going to optimize the d's to force this integral equation to be satisfied. Yeah? So all the methods are changing d's? Yeah. They're all changing d's. And it's just trying to, your criterion, your, me your error measure. How, how, how do you measure error? How do you, what do you think is good? You want to make something small, some kind of error small, but you have to figure out what are you going to define your error to be. And you'll get different solutions depending on which error, you, which error measure you use. All right? Is this okay? All right, now, this one's maybe pretty straightforward. I'm just going to write down a bunch of algebraic equations that depend on my d's, and then I'm going to solve them. And this looks a lot like... Um, uh, an F-solve problem, right? This is a you know Newton problem or something like that. So system of algebraic equations should be okay, yeah. So that one you should be pretty well set up to do right now. Let's just think of how many equations there are. So we have, so we have our basis set y and t, t and i, t i, t. That's our Basically said, and this is a sum over i equals one to, say, the number of basis functions. What do you want to call that? Uh, n. Sound good? Okay. So we have n basis functions, and so we have how many unknowns here? Uh, maybe n's not good because n's this one. Let's call it unknowns. Okay. Okay. All right. In fact, I'll even change this to k two. Just to make life easier for you. Is that right? Okay. So um, there's, there are, how many D and Ks are there? There's N, where N is the dimension, the number of ODs, and, or the number of components in Y, times K. That's how, many, that's how many Ds we got that we're going to adjust. So we need, if we want to have an equal number of equations and unknowns, we have to have as many equations as that, right? So what equations do we got? How many equations? So uh, if we just have an ODE BVP, we typically have N boundary conditions, right? So that many boundary conditions, because we need one boundary condition for each differential equation, right? One integration constant for each one. So we typically have N boundary conditions. Um, and then we have, in collocation, we have however many capital M time points we chose, right? So we have M, uh, M equations, no, that's not right. We have an equation like that for every component of G. So it's M times N equations from the collocation. All right. So, just looking at this, it looks like we have n times m plus one um, equations, and we have n times k uh, unknowns that we're trying to adjust. And so, therefore, this says we should say, choose k to be equal to m plus one. 
So if we choose, we want to say we want 100 basis functions, then we need 99 time points to do collocations at in order to do exactly determine everything. Is that okay? How many people think this is okay? Okay, he agrees. It's okay. The rest of you, no opinion. This is like the American political system. Only, you know, 5% of people vote. Everybody else just listens to Donald Trump on the radio. All right. Okay. Um, so this is the, um, this is how many equations we need. Now, sometimes people will choose the basis functions so that, say, some of the boundary condition equations might be satisfied automatically. Okay, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about cleverness in choosing, boundary con uh, of choosing basis functions. So one possible thing is you can try to cleverly choose basis functions so that no matter what values of Ds you choose, you're always going to satisfy some of the boundary, con boundary conditions. Um, and so uh, you, sometimes you don't get a full value of N because some of these boundary conditions are, are, don't help you to determine the Ds. Any values of the Ds will work. And so in those cases, you need a few, might need another time point or something. Get some more equations. All right. Okay, so that's collocation. And um, I, I think this should be like perfectly straightforward. You just value your Ys. You need to have your dy dt's. You'll need them because they appear in G as well. And they're just going to be the summation over K of D and K phi prime K T. And so you choose basis functions that you know the analytical derivatives of. So now you know these answers. And now you can write down, you can evaluate this at TM, any time point TM. So you evaluate at your time, at your time points. You evaluate these guys at your time points. You plug them all into your G, G expression over here. And you force it equal to 0 by varying the Ds. All right? No problem. Yep. So that's collocation. So that's pretty easy. And because it's so easy, it's, it's kind of pretty widely used um, as one, one way to go. Okay. Doesn't require, all it requires is you have to know the, the derivatives of your basis functions. Doesn't require, in particular, it doesn't require any integrals. Um, where you see the other methods are going to involve integrals, so we'll have to figure out how we're going to evaluate those. So if you, if you have functions you don't know how to integrate, then this is definitely the way to go. Just do collocation. And if you use collocation with enough points, you're forcing the error to be zero at a lot of points, then probably it won't get that big in between the points. At least you can hope that it won't get that big between the points. And you can try it with different numbers of points and different size numbers of base functions and keep, you know, see what you can do. See if, you get, if it converges to something, if you're lucky. All right, so that's, that's uh, one way to go. And um, it's just an f solve problem, and all that's happening is forming a Jacobian matrix inside there. Now, you still have to choose which basis functions you want, and there's a lot of basis functions that you know that you know the derivatives of. So um, there's some issue here about what, what choice is best, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, one thing you have to watch out for is you don't want your basis functions to be linearly dependent um, because then you'll end up with sort of an indeterminate uh, values of D. Different, different Ds, sets of Ds will give you exactly the same Y. If, the, if, the, if these fees, if, if one of these fees is a linear combination of other fees in your set, then you could, you could have different values of Ds that would actually correspond to exactly the same Y. Because of that, when you do a Jacobian matrix as part of your Newton solve, the Jacobian is going to be singular. And then the whole thing's not going to work. Okay, so just, just that's one thing to watch out for. Um, and actually, it doesn't really matter if the, if the functions are orthogonal in the sense of being functions orthogonal. It's really whether the vector phi k evaluated at tm is uh, if those are independent of each other or not. I feel like we talked about this before. Yes? All right, so anyway, as long as the phi evaluate TM, if those things are, are vectors which are not linearly dependent on each other, this should work fine. Okay. All right. Um, now, really writs. Um, this one here often gets to be kind of messy. Um, part of it is that inside this norm of this vector, you, you'll, it's squared, so you end up getting squares of your Ds. So the whole thing is definitely nonlinear in D to start with. 
Um, and then you have to be able to evaluate all the integrals that come up. So, uh, so this is really sum over n of g n of t d squared that you're trying to integrate. Right? So you have a lot of these functions squared. You have to add them up. You could do it, but the algebra gets, gets a little complicated. So this is not so commonly done unless the G has some special form that makes it the, the algebra a little bit easier. But there's no reason you can't do it in principle. But it's just, it just is a little bit of a mess because you get a lot of integrals of cross terms between the Gs and so in, in the Ds inside there. And so not, not so commonly done. Um, Though one, one case where it is done a lot is in, uh, actually in quantum chemistry, um, methods called variational methods in quantum chemistry use Rayleigh runs to figure out the coefficients of molecular orbitals and stuff like that. Um, so if you, certain methods. But they've actually come out, gone out of favor recently, so you probably won't use it that often. But in the past, that was a big, big deal. Um, Galerkin is, is used the most of anything. Um, so let's talk about that one for a minute. Now, the, the concept, where does this equation come from? I guess that's one thing. So maybe we can back up and say, well, where did the collocation come from? Collocation is actually like a special version of this, where I choose, instead of these basis functions, I use delta functions. So if I integrated with delta functions, t minus tm. So you know, another way to look at the collocation is I'm demanding that the integral of t, delta function t minus tm g n of t dt is equal to zero. OK? So um, now instead of using the delta functions, I'm using these functions, the basis functions. So I don't know if that's any particularly obvious why you do one or the other. But anyway, you, you have a choice. And if you, anytime you do this kind of integral with, with some number of functions, you get some number of equations that can help you to determine the d's. Um, this particular choice of the basis functions, one way to look at it is you can say, well, suppose um, my solution G, Gn, suppose I could write this as a sum of some different expansion coefficients. So I can write like this, plus, um, sorry. Okay, so there's two terms. One is the, the expansion of the residuals in the basis set that I'm using. And one is the, all the rest going out to infinity of all the rest, other basis functions in the universe. And if I think my basis set is very complete, that it kind of covers all the kinds of functions I'm ever going to deal with, both in Y and in G, in the residual, then this would be a reasonable thing. And you might expect that this term, if you pick big, K big enough, this might be small. So that's sort of where the idea is. So then if I think this is small, then I want to make sure I make this part as close to accurate as possible. And this condition is basically doing that. It's saying that I want the um, error to be orthogonal to the basis functions, in the sense that when, um, for two functions, the integral of the two functions like this is like an inner product, just like the inner product between two vectors. So I'm saying like in the, in the vector space, in the function space that I'm working in, I don't want to have any error. That's what this is saying. But I'm going to have, well, really I'm going to have is that there's other G terms, which are the rest over here. These guys will not be orthogonal to the, to the first part. Does that make sense? So, so the, there's still some error left in my G. But the part in here, I can make it go to zero. Okay. So that's, that's where this equation comes from conceptually. All right. 
And we'll come back to, when we do least squares fitting, we'll come back to the same, the same idea. Um, so this is what the equation looks like. And um, the disadvantage of this one is it involves some integrals. And so you have to be able to evaluate the integrals. All right. Um, so that's the downside of this function. So cleverly choosing your basis functions to make it easy to evaluate the integrals is like the key thing to make this a good method. Um, and just like we needed analytical expressions for the derivatives here, now we need analytical expressions for integrals that we're going to get from this guy. Okay. Um, so let's, let's think about what basis functions we can choose that might make it easier to evaluate the integrals. So the integrals, suppose we can write g explicitly like this. So g is equal to d, dn is dyn dt minus fn dt, suppose. Okay. Then what integrals am I going to get? Well, dyn dt is, is the sum of the derivatives of the basis functions. And y is just this, this sum up there, right? Some of the basis functions. And so I'm going to have integrals that look like this is like um, I have an integral of phi j summation d phi prime i, uh, no, okay. T. dt, uh, that'll be the integrals from the first term. And then I'll have uh, minus some integrals of the second term here. So phi j fn of t y, um, where y is the sum, it's actually like a matrix actually. All right, because y, this y is a vector, it's all the y ends. And so all the y, the whole y vector is d times the phi vector. Where D is that big matrix, the elements are D and K. And so if you, th these integrals, this thing here, is a summation of D and K, the integral of phi J, phi K prime. And so if you choose your basis functions cleverly, you might be able to know all these integrals analytically. But if you don't choose them cleverly, who knows what kind of horrible mess you'll end up here. All right. You really want to, do, ideally, you really want to get these all analytically so you don't have to do numerical integration as a loop inside your, all the rest of the work you're going to do in this problem. Okay. And then these ones also, now knowing something about this is really important, or you may have to do, you may have to do um, numerical integration here because this could be really a mess. You have a lot of fees inside some function, which could be a nonlinear function of these guys. And so, in principle, this could be really horrible. Um, so you may have to do numerical quadrature for those guys. All right. Okay, and so, um, if you're going to do Galerkin's method, a big part about it is thinking ahead of time, oh, what basis function am I going to use? How can I make the basis function so I can evaluate the integrals easily? Um, and then I might have a chance to do it. All right, questions so far? It's okay. Yeah. Phi j. Oh, phi, sorry, phi j of t. Yeah, I'll get rid of the t's. Okay. These are both functions of t. And you're integrating over t. And these integrals from t naught to t phi. Your domain. All right. Now, in Glorkin's method, in addition to these integral equations, I still have the integrals, the equations at the boundary conditions. 
So I still have some equations that look like collocation equations that are evaluated at a TM. Do I have that anywhere? No? Somewhere? I have equations like this, except it's not G, it's Q. It's the, it's the boundary condition equations have to be true at the boundary conditions. All right, so they're the same as before, Q. Or I wrote this before, what? Q N of um, dy dt evaluated at tn, y of tn, tn is equal to zero. That's, that's sort of the general way to write a boundary condition. Um, and so there'll be some special ends, the boundaries, where I want to have a, extra conditions. I'll get some equations like this. These have to be satisfied in Glurkin's method as well, and they will, they'll not be integrals. They're just at tn. And so, uh, in addition to these integral equations that you have to solve over here, you want these things to be zero, and you also want to satisfy the boundary conditions. Okay. Um, so then, uh, all these methods, a big part of it gets to be cleverness of uh, basis function debt choice of basis functions. And there's kind of two families of approaches. So one family is, um, is, is global basis functions. So basis functions that are defined on the whole domain. Um, and there's special ones, um, sines and cosines, Bessel functions, uh, all these functions that you've heard of from your classes, all the special functions. And a lot of them, the integrals are known for a lot of cases. Um, there might be special tricks that make the integrals easy to evaluate. Um, they can satisfy the boundary conditions automatically. And some of them, for example, many of the problems we have look like this, like the heat, heat flow equation. So you have like a different, um, which it won't be D. It'd be like a, I'm probably gonna get this wrong. It's like kappa or alpha, which one is it? Alpha. Alpha d uh, squared t x squared minus, there's some source of heat that might depend on the temperature. And this has to be, say, equal to zero. Um, right, does this seem, you have seen lots of this before? Yeah, yeah I've seen this before. So this is a common one. So in this case, you might try t to be a sum of, say, signs. So, so d and k sine of k something, something, something in there. And the, the cleverness of this is that d squared phi k dx squared is going to be equal to some number times phi k because the second derivatives of sines are also sines. Right. So all your differentials will solve, and in fact, uh, the derivatives will be really simple. Now, the Q terms could still be a horrible mess. Like, for example, this could be an Arrhenius thing where the T is up in the exponent, and then the whole thing might be horrible anyway. But at least the differential part is like super easy. Okay. And you can also, you might have a boundary condition, say, at one end, the dt dx at some place like t final x final is equal to zero, right? That might be like you're, you're up against an insulator or something like that, so you don't have any heat flow. So that'd be a boundary condition you might have. And then by cleverly choosing your definition of the signs, you could force that all the signs satisfy this derivative condition. Okay, so you make, re rescale your coordinates so that ends up at pi over two, and all signs of everything at pi over two is always zero, the derivative, so you're good. So you can do some clever tri trickiness to try to make the problem easier to solve. And so that's one whole branch of these basis function methods, is clever basis functions to match the special problem you have. Okay, so that's one option. Uh, then the other option is the non-clever approach, uh, where you just say, well, I got a computer, who cares about being clever, let's just brute force it, all right? And instead, you just wanna write a general method to any problem you can solve, and this is more or less what COMSOL does, and you're gonna do it. Um, and so, the distinction here is that this kind of thing, this sine function is, has a value everywhere, all across the domain. 
So this is kind of like a global function. Okay. And the alternative is to do local basis. Try to have basis of functions that are only defined in little tiny areas. And then at least when I integrate the integrals, I don't have to integrate over the whole range. I have to integrate right around my little basis function. Um, so this global basis function, this is sort of someone we're doing interpolation. Do you remember? You could use high order polynomials to interpolate, or you could alternatively uh, do little piecewise um, interpolations, say with straight lines between your points. And you know, it's, it's not so clear, actually, which would be the best way to do it. Or maybe you want to do some combination, do little parabolas between little triples of points or something. That might be a good interpolation procedure. Um, it's the same thing here. If you, if some problems, you can find a global basis set that works great, and you should use it. In other problems, you might do better to just break up the domain in little tiny pieces, and then do simple little uh, polynomials or something in those little domains. All right. So this is a global basis. Let's see a local basis. Should we, is it okay to delete this? So local basis functions. A really common choice for these guys are the B splines. And in particular, first order B splines. And these functions have the shape um, phi, phi k, it looks like this. So it's zero all the way away from up to t i minus one. Then it goes up to one at t i, and then it goes down to zero again. It goes out. Okay, so this function is a B spline. It's also called a tent function because it looks like a tent. Some people call it a hat function. I don't, I don't have a pointy head, so I don't think it looks like a hat to me, but they call it a hat function, so I guess they, they must have hats like that. Um, and this is a very common basis set. And the nice thing about this basis function is it's zero, except in this little tiny domain around it. Okay? And it's the only uh, basis function in the whole set that has a non-zero value at ti. And so if you want the function to equal something at ti, it's going to be equal to the, the coefficient of this basis function. Right? Because we're going to write y n of t is equal to summation d n k k of t, and so if I really care about y n evaluated at t i, the only only one basis function, this whole sum, is going to have a non-zero value there. So that's going to be equal to d n um, d n k, where this is the special k. K prime matches up to t i. Okay, so there's one basis function that looks like this. There's another one over here. That's the one base centered on this, on this point, and there's another one over here. So on this point and so on. And I have as many basis functions as I have points in my... So this is like a, a way I've discretized the problem, but I've kept it, my solution is continuous function, because my y, that's a sum of these guys, has a value everywhere as a continuous function. The way this is written, it looks like it might not be differentiable at all the points, because it has all these kinks. Um, but there's a, there's a clever trick you can do to deal with those the kinks. So actually, it's not a problem. So yeah. So for these basic functions, how would you define them at the boundary of t0 and t0? So you'll have a basis function at the very end. Suppose, it, suppose this is t0 here. You'll have one like that. So. OK, so it's just, just a half of a 10. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So locality is really good because it makes the Jacobian matrix sparse of the overall problem. Um, so 
when I compute the integrals um, of this thing, for example, the integral of phi i of t, phi i minus 1 of t dt, this turns out to be equal to 1 over 2 times t i minus t i minus 1. Take that back. Just one half. Just half. So the, it is like a brilliant thing. Right. Is that right? Maybe it does have a ti around the field as well, but not. I'll double check. Possibly including the delta t here. But I can't remember. All right. Um, but it's it's very the, the integrals are very analytical, and only certain ones are non-zero. So only when the, the two i's, sorry, when the two i's differ by, by one unit do they have a non-zero integral. All the rest of them are all zeros. So when I write down these equations, there are many, 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 many zeros. So it looks horrible when I write Galerkin's method. I get so many integrals, but actually a zillion of them are zero. Um, and then there's a bunch of special tricks I can do that make it even better than that. OK. Um, so then the Jacobian sparse. So that, that'll save you a lot of time in linear algebra, which allows you to use a lot of points. So you can use a very large basis set because you, you end up with sparse Jacobians. It means it's not going to fill your memory, storing all the elements of the Jacobian, even if the number of points is very large. Um, and also, there's vast numericals to solve solution methods for those. So that's the, that's the idea of this. Um, I guess we could try to actually, should we try to carry one of these out? I don't know how, how you guys are up for trying to do a lot of algebra on the board. You think I can do the algebra on the board? That's a, that's a real question. All right. Should I, should I do it for collocation, or are you guys confident you can do collocation? You all right with collocation? You're fine with collocation. Great. OK. So we'll just go right into Galerkin. So Galerkin, and we'll use a local basis. So um, the equations, most of the equations we have to solve are of this type, phi j. Um, T times the residual function uh, of summation d and k phi k prime uh, um, summation d and k of phi k t is equal to zero. Right, we have a lot of equations like that. But we're trying to find the d's that are going to force all these integrals to be 0. OK, so we have um, a lot of different j's we're going to try. We want this to be true for all the n's. Um, and then we're going to adjust these, these d and k's to try to force this to be 0. All right, that's the, that's the main problem. And then on top of this, there's some equations with boundary conditions. Too. Um, so now we have to look at what the form is. If the form is, oh, I erased it. If, it's, if I can make this explicit in the derivatives, which I can do very often, um, for example, this could be dyn dt minus fn. Right. So then dyn dt is just this. And then I'll have another term, fm, which will depend on that horrible thing. And so the integral of phi j, and I'll just remind you that phi j is only phi j is not equal to 0 if um, t j minus 1 is less than t. It's less than tj plus 1. All right, that's the only, the only places where my local basis function 
is non-zero. That's where the tent is. And all the rest of it's zero. So when I have this integral, originally I have it t naught to t final, but actually I could replace this with t j minus one to t j, and it's just the same, because all the integral outside that domain is zero, because this function's zero. All right, so at least I have a small little domain to do the integral over. Yep. TJ plus one, thank you. Yes. Yes. Plus one. Yes. Is that all right? Okay. So I have this integral, and then I have this times the derivative term, so it's dnk dk prime minus the same integral j minus one, j plus one, vj. Oh, sorry. Fn. Oh, the summation of dn. K phi. K maybe t. Okay. Now, this derivative of pk, well, I just told you what it was. It's 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 just like a heavy side functions. So this integral you'll know analytically. Like it's it's either zero or it's a half. Maybe a minus a half. Whatever. But it's nothing nothing complicated and you'll just know it right off the bat. So this this is all can be known and and sparse. It's only gonna be when k is equal to j minus one or j plus one that this will be non zero and all the rest of it will be zero. Okay? So that's mostly zeros. This one over here um, in principle, I have quite a huge sum here, k equals 1 to k, where I have all my basis functions, which is all my points, where I put my little tents down. So I have a, a domain, and I've parked a lot of tents all on the domain. That's my basis functions. And I'm trying to figure out sort of how high the tent poles are on all those tents. And, the, and my total function is the sum of all the heights of those tents. Okay? Um, uh, but this... This guy is only non-zero in this little domain. And these guys, most of them are zero in that, in that domain because they're mostly tents that are far away from where my special tent phi j is. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture. Uh, here's the domain from t naught to t final. Over here is my tent corresponding to phi j, which is centered around tj. That's this, this function. And then this guy's are all the other tents. There's a tent here, there's a tent like this, there's another tent like this, another tent like this, all these tents. Those are all the basis functions, starting from k equals 1 and going up. All of these guys are 0 in this domain, because they all have 0 tail. So almost all of these, the f's, doesn't really pick up anything from any of those guys in the domain I care about. The only domain I care about is this domain right here. And this whole sum is all zero except for a few special k's when k is equal to j minus one, j, or j plus one. So I only have to worry about three terms inside contributing to the y in the region of t that I care about. All right? So when I want to compute the Jacobian with respect to d, the only terms here where the Jacobian's going to be non-zero are when are for d. Let's see, I have a Jacobian, which is the derivative of this whole thing, d d d n k, right? And that's only uh, non-zero if k is equal to j minus one j or j plus 1. You guys see that? How many people do not see this? How many people are lying? This is this is really important concept for the locality. So this is the advantage of a local basis set is that the Jacobian will turn out to be really sparse because it's only non-zero in this special case. And you might have a thousand points, a thousand of these little tents, a thousand basis functions in this sum, but only three of them are non-zero. 
for for each each n. So actually, it's three times n of the number of non-zero. Is that right? Because it just depends on the k. The, the k there's three of the three of the k's are non-zero. There's a thousand of these guys to so free. Yep. Okay, so that's that's the big trick of locality, and then also because these integration ranges are so small, because you choose your points really finely spaced, then you might get away with simple polynomial expansions of f, for example, around around the points, or low Taylor expansions, or all kinds of little tricks, or you could even do a quadrature and pre determine some points, do a Gaussian quadrature to evaluate the integral. Um, you, but you only need a few points because you know it's a little tiny range of dt. Right? And you would hope that you've chosen so many phi's, so many time points, that your function doesn't change much from one time point to the next. So more or less, first order, it's constant. Your function is constant with respect to t in this little tiny domain, and then maybe it has a little slope. And then if you're really, really being fancy, you might be able to put a parabola on it. But it's not going to change that much. If it's changing a lot, that's telling you you don't have enough time points. You should go back and put some more basis functions in. Um, and then you can get a good sling. Because what we're really doing here is when we use this basis set, if I add up these guys, what I'm really doing is piecewise linear interpolation between all the points. So I'm approximating my, my y versus time. It's going to look like this. Right, it's got it's, it's piecewise linear because that's what you the only thing you can make from adding up a bunch of straight line segments, a bunch of tenths is a bunch of straight lines, and so this is what the the, the approximate function is. Well, you can see this is really bad if these functions are too different from each other. But if they're all like this, then you think well maybe it's not so bad to use piecewise linear. Yeah. Uh, when, you're, when inside F solve, when it's trying to to solve for the D's, it's gonna it's solving each of these this, this giant set of equations, a whole lot of equations like this. They all come into a gigantic F. That's the F of D that I need to make equal to zero, and so I'm varying the D's. I need the Jacobian of that gigantic F. Now the problem because it's gigantic, right? I need a lot of points, a lot of closely spaced points to make my function look smooth. That means that the number of base functions is really huge. So the Jacobian principle is, is huge number squared. You know, I have a thousand points, say, discretizing my domain, and then it's a thousand by thousand Jacobian. It might be really hard to solve it, or it costs a lot of CPU time, or use a lot of memory. But fortunately, almost all the elements are zero. So it's like you know, it has a sparsity of you know, zero point three percent or something is the is the occupancy. So it's almost all completely sparse, and therefore you can solve it even though it's gigantic. Yes. So this case over, right? you already chose the function. Yeah. Um, we're trying to find D. So we're really trying to solve a problem that's F of D is equal to zero. That's our our fundamental problem we're trying to solve. When we're doing Galerkin, right, we have something equals to zero and it depends on D. And we're trying to find the d's. So this is the, really the function we're trying to solve. In order to evaluate the elements in this, we have to compute a whole bunch of integrals with the Galerkin method. So it's, that's the complexity. But the basis functions, we know what they are. We pre-specified them. So the whole question is just what the d's are. And the d's get multiplied by a whole lot of integrals. That's the, is this right? <coughs> I think I, mis maybe I misunderstood the question. Yeah, OK. So you have f of d is 0, so therefore we probably want to know j with respect to d. Okay, uh, time ran out before clarity was achieved. We'll try to achieve clarity on Wednesday morning.